Good morning, Blue Jay friends, and thanks for being here. This is Blue Jays vs. Them, and I'm your host, Jerry Schwenard. If you're new here, I hope you'll stick around and become a regular listener. I want to welcome back all my regular listeners. I'm in complete awe that people actually want to listen to me every week. Seriously, thanks for tuning in. Or is it clicking on? Oh, whatever. Well, thanks for continuing to come back. The Jays have now played 27 of their 33 spring training games, and that leaves only six games left. At the time of this episode's publishing, next Thursday is the season opener. Are you as excited as I am? If you have any questions or comments, you can now go to the website at www.bluejaysversusthem.ca. That's bluejaysvsthem.ca. You can also find my social media links on the website. Here's what we'll be covering in this week's episode. We'll do a recap from last week, continue our segment of stats for pitchers and batters, the Blue Jays score and record for the past week of spring training, WC elimination round and championship, and a look at the week ahead in Grapefruit League schedule for the Jays, season predictions for the AL East, and some closing remarks. Last week's episode was just over 16 minutes. I tried to keep the recaps short. In some cases, there wasn't a whole lot of highlights to talk about. Next week, things start for real, so I'll try to finish across the typical stats line for both pitchers and hitters. I can come back to this segment perhaps in the offseason or next spring. Let me know if you've enjoyed this segment. Did I cover a stat that you didn't already know or weren't sure about? Is there a stat I didn't cover that you wished I did? Or did you find it a complete waste of time and wished I'd use that time to talk more about the games? Comment and let me know because your feedback is crucial. Last week, I continued across the pitching stats line and talked about the holds, saves, and save opportunities. The next few columns of a pitcher's stat line would be I, P, H, and R. And those stand for innings pitched, which is self-explanatory, H, which is hits, as you might have guessed, and R is for runs, which is runs allowed. These are often found only on expanded stat lines, so I'll skip over to what I will refer to as a quick stats line, which includes... G for games, wins, losses, and ERAs, the previously mentioned IP, followed by SO, which is strikeouts. Of course, that's any time a batter gets called on on strikes. Here's something I didn't know for years watching baseball. Have you ever seen fans post their series of Ks on the side of a fascia, usually in the upper decks? For years, I didn't understand why they would post the Ks backwards. Seriously. For years, I didn't know it meant called strike. I just thought they didn't realize it was backwards. You know, it's tidbits like this I decided to do this segment in the first place. Okay, well that brings us to WHIP, which stands for Walks, Hits, Innings Pitched. The formula for WHIP is Walks plus Hits divided by Innings Pitched. So anything under 1, I consider great. Anything above 2, well, that's probably a concern. I think that should do it for now. Again, let me know how you feel about this segment. Okay, now for the batters. Last week I touched on doubles, triples, and home runs. I also talked about the ground rules. This week, let's look at RBIs, walks, intentional walks, and strikeouts. An RBI is a run batted in, but don't let the name fool you. The run doesn't have to be batted in to be an RBI. An RBI is awarded to the player at the plate whose play resulted in a run or runs being scored, with two exceptions, an error and a double play. I actually didn't know that about the double play, so I learned something here too. So what does count? Obviously, a hit that brings in a run, well, it can also be a sacrifice hit or a bunt, hitting the ball far enough in the outfield or close enough in the infield to force the defense to prevent the batter from reaching base but advancing the runners on the base resulting in a run score. The batter will also record an RBI with a walk or being hit by the pitch with the bases loaded, which leads us to walks. On the stats line, the BB, which is base on balls, which is when a pitcher throws four balls which are deemed outside of the strike zone by the home plate umpire, assuming the batter didn't swing at them, of course. With the new pitch clock, they'll also be awarded a called ball when the pitcher doesn't begin their windup within the allotted time. Then there's a stat for IBB, which is intentional walks. It used to be four consecutive balls being thrown high and away from the batter and far enough that the batter won't even offer at it, resulting in a walk. Batters will also be given an intentional walk if the fourth ball is an obvious attempt outside of the strike zone. Major League Baseball has done away with throwing four balls out of the strike zone to walk a batter intentionally. Now the manager only needs to hold up four fingers to show the umpire their intent. That leads us to the strikeout. There are four types of strikes. The called strike and the swinging strike. Well, that's only two you're saying. I'll get to the third and the fourth in a moment. The called strike is any pitch that was within the strike zone when the batter didn't make an attempt at it. So what's the strike zone? (laughs) 
Yeah, some umpires don't know either. The strike zone is the projected area that is directly over and the width of the plate, above the batter's knees and below the midpoint between their shoulders and the top of the pants. Most will call it at the letters, which refers to the lettering of the jerseys, and also a famous podcast. Of course, a swinging strike is any ball missed by the batter, regardless of whether it's in the strike zone or not. The third way to get called for a strike is one I didn't know about when I played Little League, or at least not when I started. It's the foul ball. When a ball is hit outside of the foul lines, it would be called a strike so long as it falls safely to the ground. However, after two strikes... It's just a foul ball, meaning it won't be recorded as a third strike, with one exception. A bunted ball. Balls that are bunted foul will result in a third strike, which is why players rarely attempt to bunt after two strikes. The strikeout occurs when three strikes are recorded against the batter. Well, in most cases, this will be recorded as an out. Right now, most of you might be asking, what do you mean, most cases? Well, glad you asked. If a third strike is called, but the catcher fails to catch the ball, and first base is not occupied by a runner, the batter may attempt to steal first. The out will be recorded if the batter is tagged with the ball by the catcher, or the ball is thrown ahead of the batter, reaching first base. Oh, what about the fourth type of strike? Oh yeah, well, that's new, and it involves the pitch clock. A batter will be issued a strike if, by the 8 second mark of the clock, they are not in position and facing the pitcher. Alright, that should do it for our segment on batter stats. Okay, let's step away from uh, Blue Jays baseball for a minute and we'll talk about the World Baseball Classic. In the final pool standings, Cuba finished atop Pool A, with Italy finishing in second. All five teams in that pool finished with a 2-2 record, so the final standings were decided by runs allowed tiebreaker. Things were a little clearer in Pool B with Japan going undefeated, finishing first. Australia came in second with a 3-1 record. Pool C did come down to the final day's matches. In the end, both the United States and Mexico had a 3-1 record, but Mexico finished on top with a first tiebreaker in head-to-head matchups. Canada's loss to Team Mexico on the final day put them in third with a 2-2 record. Pool D, much like Pool B, had a clear 1-2 finish as Venezuela went undefeated and Puerto Rico with a finish of 3-1. In quarterfinal matchups, runner-up Australia in Pool B played top seed Cuba from Pool A. Cuba won 4-3. The second quarterfinal match was between top seed of Japan from Pool B and the runner-up from Pool A, Italy. Japan beat Italy 9-3. The third quarterfinals were between Team USA, the runner-up from Pool C, and Pool D winner Venezuela. Venezuela would fall to Team USA 9-7, who would go on to face Cuba in the semifinals. The final quarterfinals saw top seeded Mexico narrowly defeat Puerto Rico 5-4. Cuba fell to the United States 14-2 in the first semifinal. Team Japan defeated Mexico 6-5 in a dramatic come-from-behind walk-off win in the second semifinal and was the home team for the championship game. Japan was awarded world champions after defeating the United States 3-2. The final inning couldn't have been played out any better if it was scripted, unless you were hoping for a victory from Team USA, of course. Shohei Otani, pitching to his LA Angels teammate and arguably one of the best hitters in the league, Mike Trout. Team USA is down by one run, two outs, and none on. The count is full. Otani throws a sweeper down and away for a swinging strike three. Game. The Jays entered the week, well, my week being Thursday to Thursday anyway, with a grapefruit record of 12-7 after defeating Pittsburgh last Wednesday. Last Thursday, they went to play Baltimore. Zach Thompson got the start, going three complete, giving up five hits, including a home run. Four runs and struck out three. Leo Jimenez led off with a double and would score the first run off a single by Addison Barger. He would later score the Jays' second run off a Nathan Lucas single. They were held off the score sheet until the top of the ninth inning when they scored two more runs. Not enough to defeat the O's this day. The final score, Toronto four runs off ten hits with no errors. Orioles seven runs off a 11 hits with one error. And on Friday, the Jays had a double split squad day against the Phillies. In Clearwater, Chris Bassett got the start, giving up one run off a one-out home run in the first, going five complete with no walks and one strikeout. Eric Swanson took the loss, allowing three hits, including a two-run homer in the sixth. Zach Pop allowed the Phillies their fourth run, but it would be enough. Toronto only managed scoring two runs. The second run came off a Cam Eden leadoff home run in the top of the sixth. The final score, Toronto two runs off five hits with one error. The Phillies had four runs off ten hits with one error. In that Eden, the Jays would also fall to the Phillies. Kikuchi managed only three and a third innings, allowing two earned runs off one hit. Although he struck out three batters, he also gave up three walks. 
The final score, Philadelphia, eight runs on nine hits, no errors. The Blue Jays, one run off six hits with no errors. The Blue Jays hosted the Yankees on Saturday, and Bowden Francis got the start pitching three innings. Striking out five, he gave up two earned runs off three hits with one walk. Both runs came in the top of the first. The Jays would answer back in the bottom of the inning with one run of their own. They would score two more runs in the second and two more in the fourth. The final score, New York two runs on six hits with no errors. The Blue Jays had five runs off six hits with no errors. Sunday, the Jays took on the Rays at the drop. Alec Manoa got the start pitching six strong innings, allowing one run on five hits and striking out four. The Rays starter, Drew Rasmussen, went five innings, giving up only two hits and no runs. Striking out two batters and a two-out walk to Yandy Diaz followed by a hit batter set the table for Harold Ramirez's RBI single in the third, the game's only run. Final score, Toronto had no runs on three hits with no errors and the Rays got one run on six hits with one error. The Blue Jays won't have long to face the Rays in the regular season. Tampa will be in town on April 14th for a three-game weekend series that will close out the first homestand. Monday, the Jays were in Lakeland to face the Tigers. Gosman got the start and pitched five strong innings. He gave up three hits, no walks, and struck out six. Adam Simber was in line for the win after coming into the pitch in the bottom of the seventh. Jay Brown earned a hold, pitching the scoreless inning in the eighth, and Trent Thornton pitched the ninth without allowing a hit, striking out two with no walks. The Jays scored two runs in the bottom of the eighth and three more in the ninth off a Devontae Brown home run. The final score, Toronto five runs on five hits and no errors. Tigers zero runs off five hits with no errors. The Tigers will be in Dunedin for a six o'clock game on Saturday for their final meeting of spring. The Jays had a day off on Tuesday and on Wednesday the Jays hosted the O's for their final meeting of spring training. Jose Burrios got the start, pitching five plus innings, giving up six hits, including a solo home run in the sixth inning. He struck out five and walked one. Jordan Romano got the save, allowing one hit and struck out one. The final score, Baltimore one run on eight hits with no errors. Blue Jays two runs on four hits with one error. The two teams will meet up in the regular season when Baltimore comes to the Rogers Center for a weekend series May 19th. The Jays finish off the week with a 3-4 record and taking their Grapefruit League record to 15-11 with one tie. The Blue Jays only have six more games in spring training starting with today's game. The Jays will travel down to Fort Myers this time to face the Minnesota Twins in Hammond Stadium. This will be the second and final meeting of the spring with the Twins. Last Wednesday, the Twins handed the Jays a 7-0 loss in Dunedin. Their first meeting of the regular season will come on May 26th when the Jays go to Target Field in Minnesota for a weekend series. On Friday, the Jays will play host to the Phillies. And then on Saturday, the Jays will host the Tigers for the final time before the regular season. The next time the Jays will play host to Detroit will be for their home opener April 11th. Sunday, the Jays will be in George Steinbrenner Field for their last meeting with the Yankees until the Jays travel to the Bronx for a weekend series at Yankee Stadium on April 21st. Monday, the Jays will play their final game in Dunedin of this spring against the Phillies. And on Tuesday, they will wrap up their spring training in Baycare Park to face the Phillies for the final time until the Jays go to Citizen Bank Park in Philadelphia for two games on May 9th. This is it. Next Thursday, the season opener. The Jays will be in St. Louis for three games. Are you excited yet? I know I said I'd do predictions this week. I'm going to hold off my predictions until next week. Don't worry. I'll go beyond just the standings. I'll give you my total wins and losses, at least for the Jays. That should do it for this week's episode of Blue Jays vs. Them. Once again, I want to thank you for spending a little bit of your time with me while I talk a little bit about baseball. I hope you'll join me next week for the final episode of Spring Training, which reminds me, next week is the first game of the regular season. How should I title the episode? Should it be Spring Training Episode Number 7 or Regular Season Episode 1? If there are any questions or comments, you can leave them on the website right below the episode. You can find my links to Facebook and Twitter on the website. Again, the website is bluejaysversusthem.ca. That's bluejaysvsthem.ca. Next week, we'll recap the previous episode, finish off our look at the stats definitions, recap the final week of spring training, I'll go over some of the changes in the regular season. Home and away discrepancies. We'll start that. Look ahead at the first week of regular season. You can now find this podcast almost anywhere podcasts are available. 
now including iHeartRadio. If you are listening from a podcast provider, please subscribe and give the podcast a positive rating. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps the podcast a great deal, and it would mean the world to me. If you came across this podcast on Twitter, please like the tweet, reply, and retweet it. On Facebook, please leave a reaction, comments, and feel free to share the post. Again, these things don't cost you anything except the fraction of your time, but it helps to bring awareness to the podcast, and it really does mean the world of difference to me. I'm just starting it out, and every little bit helps. As always, I've been your humble host, Jerry Schnard, and you've been listening to Blue Jays vs. Them. Once again, I want to thank you for spending your time with me. Join me next Thursday and every Thursday of the regular season. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of your loved ones, and have a wonderful rest of your day. And let's go, Blue Jays, let's go. Bye.